Hello, I'm Burt Lancaster. We're recording narration for the unknown war. Poland's long history has been one of turbulence and controversy. Situated in Central Europe, Poland was a geographical corridor for invasion and war. During World War II, Poland suffered enormously. Six million Poles lost their lives. In 1939, Warsaw Radio played the Polonaise, a paradoxical classical background to plea for assistance to repel the Nazi invaders, two million strong. In 1943 and 1944, Warsaw again saw tragedy, suffering, and death during events of tragic circumstance. And even after Berlin fell to the Allies, Poles continued to die, liberating their town of Wrocław. In 1945, the Soviet armies forced the Nazis from Polish soil. Now our story, the liberation of Poland. It was a long war for the Poles, longer than for anyone else on the continent of Europe. Poles were still dying in Wroclaw, when in Berlin the fighting had ceased in May of 1945. Wroclaw was finally taken by the Red Army on May the 8th. The liberation of Poland cost the Red Army 600,000 lives. The German occupation and the fight against the Nazis cost the Poles six million. On Memorial Day in Poland, year after year, they light the candles again, for their own and for the Russian dead. On June 22, 1941, using Poland as a springboard, Hitler launched his attack on the Soviet Union, across the disputed borderlands of Belarusia and the Ukraine. who had escaped the Nazis in 1939 had formed a government in exile in London. At its head was General Vladislav Sikorsky. Tens of thousands of Polish soldiers had been in Russia ever since the Red Army had crossed Poland's border and entered its eastern provinces in 1939. They were commanded by General Anders, whose sympathies lay with the London Poles. Relations between Anders and the Soviets were strained. The Poles had been armed and equipped by the Red Army. But because of continued delays by Anders, they had yet to enter battle on the Soviet side. Anders wanted the Polish army to fight with the Western Allies, and Churchill supported him. Stalin finally agreed that Anders' army could leave for the West, by way of Iran. While the Battle of Stalingrad was raging in mid-1942, 100,000 strong, they began their long journey to a home many of them would never reach. between the London Poles and the Soviet government were bad. In April of 1943, Goebbels soured them completely. He announced that the bodies of thousands of Polish officers had been found in the Katyn forest near Smolensk. They had been shot, he claimed, by the Soviets. The London Poles believed that Goebbels' version might be true. In response, the Soviet government broke off diplomatic relations. Meanwhile, within the Soviet Union, a second Polish force was formed. The Kosciuszko Division. Moi 
followed by three more, armed by the Soviets. Unlike Anders' army, they were to fight on the Eastern Front. Under General Berlin, Kosciusko Division received its baptism of fire in the late summer of 1943 at the village of Lenino on the road to Smolensk. In September 1943, the Red Army recaptured Smolensk from the Nazis, and with it, the forests of Katyn. In January 1944, a Soviet committee assembled at Katyn to investigate the Polish tragedy, the massacre of 16,000 Polish officers. Dr. Burdenko, chief surgeon of the Red Army, performed the autopsies. His colleagues included the Metropolitan, Archbishop Nicholas of Moscow, and the author, Alexei Tolstoy. Western observers was Kathleen Harriman, daughter of the United States Ambassador. Letters were produced to refute the Nazis' claim that the Soviets had executed the Poles. They bore dates later than the time the Red Army had been forced to withdraw from Katyn at the beginning of the war. Dr. Burdenko made some dissections and demonstrated that each officer had been executed by a single shot in the head, a familiar style of Nazi execution. Diplomatic relations with the London Poles remained broken. The Polish people were a proud Slavic race. To the Nazis, they were an inferior breed, untermenschen, fit only for slavery or extermination. The concentration camps in Poland were some of the very worst. The top Nazi administrator in Poland was Gauleiter Hans Frank. He was utterly without mercy. Men were sent to the factories of Krupp and Daimler Benz, or the camps. Women between 15 and 25 were assigned to the brothels of the SS and the Wehrmacht. The rest to the war plants of the Ruhr, or to the gas chambers. The Jews, of course, were a special case. The Warsaw Ghetto was one of the oldest, largest, and most closely confined in Europe. When the Germans arrived in 1939, conditions soon changed.
the SS came with their checklists. The Jews left with what little they could carry. 300,000 of them. Their destination? Oblivion. In the spring of 1943, the SS decided to raise the entire ghetto to the ground. The Jews revolted. The SS entered the ghetto with grenades, flamethrowers, machine guns. Himmler had expected the action to take three days. The little Jewish army fought for four weeks. The SS set fire to the area block by block. On May 15th, the Nazis blew up a synagogue. The battle was over. Of the 56,000 Jews they rounded up, the Nazis shot 7,000 on the spot. For all this, the SS was awarded a battle honor. They commemorated the achievement with a souvenir book, lavishly illustrated and personally edited by the leader of the Nazi oppressors, General Strupp. In the summer of 1944, the Red Army had completed its plans for liberating Poland. Marshal Zhukov represented the Soviet High Command. Marshal Rokossovsky commanded the actions of the 1st Belarusian Front. In July 1944, Rokossovsky struck at the Germans with three armies of infantry and an army of tanks. Fighting alongside the Soviets were General Berling's Polish divisions, now 100,000 strong. the river Boog and entered Poland in strength. Their objective was the town of Hell. suffered under the German occupation for five years. It was the first town to be liberated. Helm secured, Rokossowski drove an armored spearhead towards Lublin, the first big Polish city on the road to Warsaw. Polish Committee of National Liberation. A 
soon as Lublin had been purged of Nazis, the Committee of Liberation set up a provisional government. The London Poles and the Lublin Committee had deep differences on the structure of Poland's future. was called Majdanek. It gave the world its first picture of the true nature of Nazism. Majdanek was an extermination camp. One of the first to enter Majdanek was a Soviet cameraman, Roman Carmen, who reported the tragedy to the United Press Agency. Majdanek's inhabitants were numbered, as if they were living carcasses. The gas chambers, the ovens, the insane experiments, all exposed for the first time. Majdanek could dispose of 2,000 bodies a day. Majdanek was a very efficient place. Nothing was wasted. had been so great that it would be a long time before they could even show emotion. One and a half million had died at Majdanek. The Red Army offensive surged westward. Within a week, the Soviets recaptured the Brest Fortress which had held out so long through the first weeks of the war. Nazi resistance was fierce and growing in strength. The first six weeks of the fighting in Poland cost the Red Army a quarter of a million killed and wounded. Front, the Red Army was drawing closer and closer to the Vistula, the last water barrier before Warsaw. At the end of July, advanced units of the Soviets and their Polish allies fought their way into Praha, a suburb of Warsaw. And set eyes for the first time on the capital. But between Praha and Warsaw lay the broad Vistula and a German counterattack with four panzer divisions in the making. For centuries, Warsaw had been one of the most romantic cities in Europe, capital of a gallant, gifted, and tragic people.
the summer of 1944, Warsaw was to undergo the worst of all its sufferings. Within Warsaw was the headquarters of the Home Army, the Polish resistance movement affiliated with the government in exile in London. On August 1st, 1944, its commander, General Bor Komarowski, gave the order to start an uprising. Surrounded by powerful Nazi forces, the Home Army could only be supplied by airdrops from the Western Allies and the Soviets. They failed. While the Warsaw Uprising was running its doomed course, the Polish First Army struggled to cross the Vistula. They were thrown back. Some still think the Red Army could have succeeded. The Soviets claim they were unable to cross the Vistula. Their troops were exhausted. Five days after the start of their revolt, the insurgents were in control of almost all of the city. Everyone had rallied to the Home Army's call. They had lost heavily, but they were still confident. The government in exile was standing by to fly in from London. They had little water, no food, no medical supplies. They were receiving nothing from the outside. still they reaffirmed their faith in their future. Picked units of the SS arrived in Warsaw on August the 8th. They were specialists. It took two months, but at last, the citizens of Warsaw were overwhelmed. 300,000 Poles had died in the uprising. On October 2nd, the Home Army surrendered. Bor Kamarowski with them. On October 11th, Hitler ordered, raise Warsaw to the ground. And that they did, with great efficiency. When the Red Army and the Polish divisions finally reached Warsaw in January of 1945, nine-tenths of the city no longer existed. Warsaw had been the goal of Polish fighting men everywhere. For the pilots of the squadrons flying over England. For the sailors shepherding the convoys across the Atlantic from America. for the tank crews fighting on the second front. For the infantry campaigning in North Africa. And Anders' men toiling over the mountains of Italy to storm the monastery at Cassino. Many would 
never see Warsaw again. Late in November, the Soviet High Command approved plans for the Red Army's winter offensive, ranging from the Vistula to the Oda, and encompassing the liberation of the rest of Poland. January 12, 1945, the opening of the offensive that would carry the Red Army to the gates of Berlin. Marshal Zhukov commanded the first Belarusian front, and Marshal Konyev the first Ukrainian front. Between them, they mustered two million soldiers, 32,000 guns and mortars, 6,500 tanks, and 5,000 aircraft, a clear superiority over the Nazi forces opposing them. They ripped through the main line of the German defenses the first day. Within a week, Warsaw was encircled. There was nothing left of the Warsaw they had known, nothing. It was unlike any other city the Red Army had liberated. There were no people at all to greet them, not a single one. The Poles had returned to silence. was finally over, the Poles rebuilt their city brick by brick, some of it exactly the way it had been before. The day after the liberation, the people began to return, slowly at first. And then in numbers, crossing the frozen Vistula on foot because the bridges had been destroyed.
gradually spirits began to rise and essential services were restored. The ruins were probed for booby traps and unexploded bombs. Warsaw was still a dangerous place. By now, Zhukov's first Belarusian front was advancing 15 miles a day. But Nazi resistance was as stubborn as ever. The Nazi garrison of Poznan totaled 60,000, three times what the Soviets had expected. It took days for General Chuikov's 8th Guards Army, the veterans of Stalingrad, to subdue it. February 23rd, the Nazis raised the white flag of surrender. And the Polish flag surmounted it. By the time Poznan was back in Polish hands, the Soviet Grand Defensive had rolled closer to the Oder and the heart of Germany. In the celebration at Poznan, there was not only relief, but a sense of expectation. The thousand-year Reich was nearing its end. South of Zhukov's armies, the first Ukrainian front was heading for Krakow. Marshal Konyak knew from Soviet intelligence that the Germans planned to demolish the city as they had Warsaw. The assault was so rapid and with such power that the Nazis' plans were frustrated. Krakow was spared to remain one of the most elegant cities in Europe.
Some of the Soviet armor was now advancing more than 40 miles a day. The strain was beginning to tell. The Red Army was now hundreds of miles from its bases. Fuel and ammunition were in short supply. The so-called Pomeranian Rampart was a formidable tangle of bunkers and anti-tank ditches. The Soviets took it in 18 days. Wehrmacht was being broken up piece by piece. To the north, Marshal Rokossovsky's second Belarusian front was moving along the Baltic shore. Its objective, Gdansk. One by one, the seaports fell to Rokossovsky's infantry. Poland's historic seaport. In 1939, as Danzig, it had been one of the bones of contention when Hitler had been seeking his pretext for war. Once more, the Poles had access to the Baltic. Nazis were gone from troubled Poland. It had taken six terrible years. Ahead lay the last river, the Oder, and the last great European battle of the unknown war. Next story, the Allies. Nearly $10 billion worth of American aid poured into the Soviet Union during the war. American heavy bombers based on Soviet soil. American and Soviet troops meeting on the German river. All parts of the Allied effort in the unknown war. 